Since 1988, the space shuttle had completed 15 years of successful missions. Each was unique, each had its own specific goals and tasks, and each had its own dedicated crew of astronauts who'd trained exhaustively to meet and carry them out. Yet each of those 87 flights did have two things in common. A safe launch. Lift off of the space shuttle discovery. And a safe landing. Nose gear touchdown. From the start, STS-107 seemed to be a mission out of sorts. By the time Columbia was finally ready to fly on January 16, 2003, its planned 16-day mission had been delayed no fewer than 18 times. All those delays had ultimately positioned the STS-107 as a sort of black sheep on the space shuttle program's launch schedule. Columbia's crew commander Rick Husband, pilot Willie McCool, and mission specialists Michael Anderson, Kalpna Chavla, Dave Brown, Laurel Clark, and Israeli astronaut Ilan Ramon would not go to the National Space Station. Their flight would require nothing more risky than orbiting the Earth. Booster ignition and liftoff of Space Shuttle Columbia with a multitude of national and international space research experiments. 82 seconds after launch, what was later described as a suitcase-sized chunk of frozen foam insulation breaks off Columbia's external tank and strikes the leading edge of the orbiter's left wing. Roger roll, Columbia. A routine same-day video review of the launch would reveal nothing unusual. However, higher resolution tracking camera film processed overnight and reviewed on flight day two by the mission's ascent team showed otherwise. You saw this little thing float toward the leading edge of the wing and, and like, uh, you know, it was like a snowball hitting something and then just being pulverized. But, but when you saw it hit, ooh, we just, we just winced because we knew, you know, the vehicle's going 500 miles an hour or better. It was inconceivable in hindsight that you could have that kind of impact um, at the speed that the vehicle was going and assume that there was no damage. And that's what we, we allowed ourselves to feel comfortable that we were right and we were dead wrong. Due to limitations in the visual clarity, the exact point of impact and extent of any damage could not be determined. If the foam strike had compromised Columbia's integrity, little, if anything, could be done to repair the orbiter in space. One week after launch, Mission Control emails the crew informing them of the debris strike. Save for a relatively minor problem with a leaky refrigeration unit, STS-107 had been without further incident. As scheduled, the order is given on the morning of February 1st for the Columbia crew to begin the landing procedure and come home to Florida. Traveling in excess of 12,000 miles per hour, the orbiter's belly begins to glow red as it descends into Earth's atmosphere. FYI, I've just lost four separate uh, temperature transducers on the left side of the vehicle, uh, hydraulic return temperatures. As reentry started and as the ground track went, went across the states, uh, there's a, the ground track, of course, uh, changes color. You can tell where the shuttle is over what part of the country it is. No onboard. Well, that display stopped updating. In other words, that display froze in a certain position. Well, sometimes you have loss of data, you have some problem with the system on the ground where you'll have those kind of outages temporarily. Well, this lasted a bit longer. Then the uh, uh, call went up to the crew, you know, a call went up and no response. Well, I don't know, I just, I just began to feel uneasy. Columbia, Houston, UHF, com check. At speeds above Mach 20, the stress becomes too much for the orbiter. We do not have any valid data at this time. The suitcase-sized chunk of foam had indeed punched a bowling ball-sized hole in the leading edge of Columbia's left wing. Within seconds, internal temperatures spike, signaling the cascade of structural disintegration. Only 16 minutes from home, Space Shuttle Columbia breaks apart in the skies over East Texas. All seven crew members are lost. GC flight. Fly GC. Lock the doors. Copy. And, and, and at that moment, I knew, I knew we lost them.
the grief is heavy. Our nation shares in your sorrow and in your pride. And today we remember not only one moment of tragedy, but seven lives of great purpose and achievement. Within days, hundreds of professionals from federal and state agencies across the country arrive in East Texas. They are joined by local volunteers to help NASA recover and catalog debris from Columbia in the hopes of, literally, piecing together an answer to the accident's cause. This is one of the many obstacles investigators are up against. It was um, uh, really heartwarming and very emotional for me to, uh, to, to, uh, to see all of these people from around the country come in to the Piney Woods of East Texas and, and spend days and weeks there marching out through these through the woods, looking for bits and pieces of the orbiter and so forth. If anybody ever wonders about the, uh, the strength of the backbone of this country, then they ought to have the privilege, like I do, to meet these people who have come here to do this. Uh, it, it just it, it shows you the fabric of what this country is made of. Determined to return to flight, stronger and safer, the grounded shuttle program had taken a fresh look at itself. During my watch, during my watch, um, uh, we lost the Columbia crew, and, and clearly as a flight director back in Challenger, we lost that crew. Um, I think about those every day, every day I come to work. I need to be very vigilant, I need to pay attention, and I need the people that work for us in this business to pay attention to what they're doing, because this is hard stuff that we do. It's very dangerous. We have not figured out a way to do a beam me up Scotty Right now, it takes a, a lot of hydrocarbons uh, moving at very high speeds through fuel pumps at very high temperatures, high pressures to get into space, and it takes a tremendous amount of effort to get out of space back in the atmosphere and get to get home. I was sent out to David Brown's parents' home. I'll never forget this moment when Judge Brown looked at me and said, Leland, my son is gone. There is nothing you can do to bring him back. But the biggest tragedy would be if you don't continue to fly and carry on his legacy. Each of the remaining three orbiters was pulled apart and refurbished. New capabilities were devised for the crew and mission controllers to assess and repair damage while on orbit. Processes and procedures were also re-examined and reinvigorated. Crew safety would never again be taken for granted. Nearly two and a half years would pass before the nation would see another orbiter poised for launch from the Kennedy Space Center. By the time that we fly the flight, uh, it's something that it feels like we have flown many times. So if things don't go well, it becomes very, very natural for us to know at certain points during the mission, if this doesn't go well or if this significant system breaks or we have this type of emergency, what's the most important thing we, we need to do now because we've been rehearsing it and it makes it look really easy. You don't really get the full effect of how much real preparation, how much real studying went into making it look that easy. Of all the changes accompanying the shuttle's return to flight, none was more significant than the one announced in early 2004 at NASA headquarters by President Bush. Our first goal is to complete the International Space Station by 2010. We will finish what we have started we will meet our obligations to our 15 international partners on this project. The shuttle's chief purpose over the next several years will be to help finish assembly of the International Space Station. In 2010, the space shuttle, after nearly 30 years of duty, will be retired from service.